Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. Whether you are tuning in to reaffirm beliefs, to support one of the two gentlemen, uh, whether you're tuning in out of curiosity or because you have nothing better to do, we are grateful that you are here, and we hope that from this point on, you will open your, your, your heart, your mind, and your Bibles as these two gentlemen engage in this most important discussion. Our premise this evening is faith with no works on the part of the believer is the sole occasion for God declaring us righteous. Boiled down, we are going to hear two people make a case for two completely different paths to salvation. However, we know Jesus did not establish two paths or two systems of faith. Ephesians 4, 5 says that there is one faith, and this means if we have two opposing views, that both of them cannot be right. And if we are talking about salvation, then this becomes the most important thing that we could ever consider. It will be on the participants to define these terms of the proposition and make the case for whether this is true or false. Tanner Dykin will have the challenge of affirming this premise to be true, and Matt McDougall will be responsible for the denial. The format will be as follows. Tanner will speak for 15 minutes. We will uh, then switch it over to Matt, who is going to speak for 15 minutes. We'll switch it back over to Tanner, who's going to speak for uh, another 10 minutes. And Matt will go after that another 10 minutes, and then we will close it out for tonight. During these speeches, we do encourage questions uh, and comments. Um, David Eastland will be engaging and compiling them and sorting them for tomorrow night with, when we will return and uh, Matt and Tanner will take the time to answer these questions and comments that you have on another video. Uh, so we do, we do encourage comments and we hope that you enjoy the show. Um, our speakers, Tanner Dykin is a pastor at Open Door Baptist Church in Mayfield, Kentucky. He is a student with the Boyce College, and he has held public classes in systematic and biblical theology. He has special interests in such the theological topics as the canon, the covenants, and the atonement. He is the author of counseling booklet, Hope for the Gender Confused, which is available for free on archive.org and probably relevant in today's culture. Matt is a student of the Bible at Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies in Knoxville, Tennessee. He is a former Baptist who converted to Christianity after testing what he was taught with what the Bible says. Matt dropped religious creeds and today he seeks to do only what the Bible says. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to David Lee who is also a student at the school that Matt attends. He's going to lead us in a prayer, and then we will turn everything over to Tanner for his uh, affirming of the proposition. David? Good evening, let's pray. Our God and loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've given us and for the life that you've blessed us with. God, we're thankful for each of these gentlemen, Matt and Tanner, and for all of those who have chosen to Join us in this debate this evening, and we ask that this debate would be a blessing to all who are involved. God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the truth that's in it, that we can apply to our lives and that uh, changes us, Father. We thank you for all of our many blessings, and we hope that all who partake with us this evening are blessed. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, I'm Tanner Dykin. As you said, I'm pastor of Open Door uh, Baptist Church. Uh, I'm affirming the proposition for tonight. Uh, it's a statement of the historic Protestant doctrine, the biblical doctrine of sola fide. Uh, I'd just like to thank our uh, moderators, the, the ones who uh, put this together, Ben and David, and for the time that they set aside for this, as well as uh, my cousin Matt, who's also uh, participating in the debate tonight. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, jump right into it. Uh, I have three uh, main contentions uh, for why I believe this doctrine. The first contention 
is that God's sovereign purposes imply sola fide. The fact that God is sovereign in salvation, the fact that God uh, has uh, power uh, and authority to uh, have mercy on whom he will, uh, implies that nothing that we do has anything to do with our uh, being justified. Uh, the uh, scripture says in Romans 8, uh, verse 28, uh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Who, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Here we have what's uh, been historically called the golden chain of redemption. What God does to the first group of people, that is his foreknowing, which has to do with election in the book of Romans. You can see that in Romans chapter 11, where it talks about Israel, whom God foreknew in the context of his choosing, that he does each of these actions to this group of people, those whom he for new, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. And you notice in there the uh, uh, fact that he justified them. This is something that God does. It's a sovereign act that he undertakes to justify them. It's not something that we get to ourselves, but what God does to us. This is confirmed in verse 33 of Romans 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justify it. Uh, he makes the uh, argument based on uh, his argument here based on the fact that it is God that justifies it. This is an action that God is doing. Since no one else does it, no one can affect it except for God. In Romans 9 verse 15, we read, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. You see, it's not according to anyone that wills, that is their free choice, their decision. It's according to God that shows mercy. It's not according to him that runs, he that puts forth effort, the same kind of language that Paul uses elsewhere to describe the Christian life. It's not according to those things, but according to God that shows mercy. And so since that's the case, uh, faith is the only occasion because faith is simply relying on God to do what he does, what he will do. Next, my second contention is that human depravity, the fact that we're sinners and that we're slaves to sin before uh, we uh, are brought to Jesus Christ, shows us that no work that we do can be the occasion of our being justified because we could do no works. We could contribute nothing. A Romans, or a John chapter 8 and verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever sinneth, or whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Of course, uh, the slave of sin, the one who serves, the one who cannot not serve sin. In verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. Uh, since we were of the devil, since we were his children, we will do what he does. And there was nothing, uh, we could do nothing else other than what our father, the devil, uh, bid us to do. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Uh, here we have uh, our state before Jesus Christ, that we were dead in sin, and a dead man cannot bring himself to life. We were walking uh, according to the same way that the world walked. We were children of disobedience. It's what we were by nature to disobey. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as others. We were uh, appointed to uh, wrath in times past because of our nature, and we could not escape it ourselves. 
Romans 8, verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If we are in the flesh, if we were are in the carnal mind, as we all were before Jesus Christ, we cannot please God. And so we, there, was, there was no work, no labor, no contribution that we could make that would please God in order for him to show mercy on us. Back in Ephesians chapter 2, continuing in verse 4 though, we read, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You see, it wasn't anything that we did. It was that God showed mercy for his great love for with he loved us. He moved first. He brought to spiritual life first, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins. And remember before, spiritual death is equated to being by nature children of wrath. It is equated to being children of disobedience. It's equated to walking after the course of this world. And so it wasn't what we did. God did this to us, bringing us to life when we were those things. And he summarizes all of this by the same statement he made before in verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Notice that it is by the grace of faith, and this is a package deal, the fact that God has shown grace to us to bring us to spiritual life and give us faith here. That is how uh, we have been uh, saved. It's not of ourselves. And notice it says, of course, not of works, lest any man should boast. And if we're going to say that uh, that this is a, a different kind of work than uh, the uh, than uh, the works of the law or works of, of other things, then we have to get around how it is that he uses the same term works in the next verse to describe the Christian life that we've been ordained to. It's not by those works of the Christian life that we've been uh, uh, that we've been saved unto. It's instead by grace through faith, which God has given us. I'd like to substantiate that claim now that the faith which we have in Christ is a gift of God itself. And it's not something we work up in ourselves. In 1 John 5 verse 4, we read, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Notice the uh, chain of uh, items here. Uh, that which is born of God. We're born of God. It overcomes the world. And what does it mean to overcome the world? It means to have faith. So first you are born of God, then you have faith to overcome the world. The new birth, the regen grace of regeneration comes before faith and is the cause of faith after it, we see. Uh, again in John 1 uh, verse uh, uh, 12, uh, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, God is the one that works first here. It's not by birth, it's not by the will of our sinful will, and it's not by the will of mankind or men individually. It is of God, we see here. Now finally, my last contention is that because uh, of the nature of imputation, the fact that we're credited with Christ's righteousness, and that it is the only basis on which we will be judged, Therefore, it cannot be the case that we do some work in order to attain to the righteousness of Christ that's credited to us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's not a righteousness which we have. In fact, in another place, Paul uses the language and he says uh, that it is a righteousness not of his own. 
but it's of the faith of Jesus Christ. It comes from God. Uh, and so here we see that because uh, that, that we're credited with Christ's righteousness, it's so-called an alien righteousness, it's not our own. And so if we're judged based on that righteousness, we cannot be judged based on any efforts that we do in order to attain to that righteousness. Otherwise, we, we make a mincemeat of what the scripture says. Isaiah 53 verse 11 says by prophecy that God will do this. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He justifies many by his own knowledge, by his own goodness, his knowledge of right and wrong. He justifies many by his life and he bears their iniquities for them. Uh, it's not based on what we've done or our righteousness or even our something that we do to, to earn God's favor with us, but rather it is all according to the righteousness of Christ. Now, finally, uh, in this, uh, under the heading of this third contention, uh, we see also that the scripture plainly states that because it is Christ's righteousness uh, and, and, and uh, because, it is, because of all this has come before, because of, of the work of God, it is therefore not uh, according to works. Uh, in Romans 4, verse 1, what shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. This is the way that Abraham was justified, not by his own works, but according to his faith. He simply believed uh, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Notice also in, in verse 2 that if he were justified by works, he would have a reason to glory. He would have a reason to take credit away from God for his, uh, for his justification, for his salvation. But instead, uh, in, instead of that, he, it says that, that God will not have this. He says, but not before God. And so in verse 3, he says he believed him and it was credited to him for righteousness. And in verse 4, uh, Paul takes this example of Abraham, and he applies it to us. In verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Notice that it says, to him that worketh not. And we got two minutes. Not put forth effort. This is keeping with the argument that Paul's making in the book of Romans. As he's building up uh, through the book, he continuously reminds us that justification, that the entire saving process is the work of God. And so even if somebody has no works, even if they've put forth no effort at all, uh, because it is God, that justifies because that uh, the righteousness of God is the thing that's being revealed in salvation from faith to faith, as it says in Romans chapter one. Therefore, it is not uh, it, it, it can be that a person uh, has no works and yet they are justified. Uh, just as he said in Romans 8 when it says that it is God that justify and in Romans 9 when he says I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and with that I'll uh, cede the rest of my time to the debate and uh, I thank you all for listening all right let's get started God's sovereignty human depravity and imputed righteousness these are the three things that he's going to use as arguments I think it's important to address each one of these and uh, to go down through there and use the points to break them down and make sure we understand them correctly. Um, first, we need to understand that faith is not just granted to you. Tanner, you know this because you yourself have had to study in order to have faith. You've had to study the word. You've had to take your free will and use it in studying that word. That did not, it was not just gifted to you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're going to have to face that. That people aren't just miraculously gifted today in this century with faith. It doesn't just happen. People have to study and come to the knowledge of what's going on. With the first point, you went with God's sovereignty. And you use uh, Romans 8.28, Romans 8.33, and 
through this section, it talks about being called. That these people are justified when they're called. Well, how does God call, Tanner? If you look at John 6.44, it'll tell you how God's called. Look at John 6.44 and 6.45. Jesus says, uh, No one can come to me unless the Father who who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. So nobody can come to the Father unless they're sent. How does that happen? Verse 45. He says, uh, and it is written in the prophets, and they all shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned. When we hear and, and learn from the scriptures, we're able to come to God. That's how we know about him. Otherwise, we just know he exists. We, don't, we cannot know Christ outside of the scriptures. So we're called into his justification through the scriptures. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 says the same thing. God calls by the gospel. So that should break down the first so- the sovereignty action. God is sovereign. He does things. He moves nations. He, I mean, he uses nations. He used Babylon against Israel in the Old Testament times. He's used, uh, he's used different people to do different things. That does not affect their salvation. And when you go to Romans 9 and 15, you're, you're talking about God moving Israel and doing things through nations there. There's nothing about salvation in those callings, in that elect, in that section of Scripture. Okay, so we need to withdraw from that. We need to get rid of that, Tanner. Uh, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It's not miraculously gifted. If it were, you wouldn't have to study. The second point is human depravity. This And, and these points, they're coming from Calvinism is where this is coming from. It's coming from the five points of Calvinism. So as I have studied and seen, you can break down these points. It's a man-made doctrine that we need to disregard. Human depravity is a total lie. Look at Jesus' words in in Matthew 9, 14. Let the little ones come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. He's telling totally innocent children that they are not depraved, and their style, their type of people, is going to be in heaven. Ezekiel, and, and the Calvinistic point is that Adam sinned, and by one man, uh, sin entered the world, and by one man... Uh, let, let me look this up. Let me look this verse up. Ezekiel eighteen twenty will tell you that um, you don't inherit your parents' sin. We don't inherit our parents' sin. Our sin and our our unrighteousness, our deeds that we've done and messed up in front of God, is only ours. Our parents are not responsible for our mess ups. We're not responsible for their mess ups. Um, in Romans 5.12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and this is the verse he's going to use to say we're totally deprived, or one of them, uh, and death through sin, and thus spread to all men because all sin. That's Romans 5.12. So through one man sin entered the world. Um, but it also says uh, in, in verse 15, For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded to many. The one man sinner entered the world and, and affected all. So if he takes that to mean that you're all totally depraved, then by Christ's death, you're all totally righteous. You're all totally saved. If all, if the condemnation of Adam marks everybody as in sin when they're born, then all are, in, are made righteous when they're born. So it's by free will. It's by choice. Um... He says we cannot seek God because we are totally depraved. That's just not true. I know because I went after God. There's many people watching that know that, hey, you know, if I study the Bible, I can learn about God, and by faith, I can draw near to him. I can know who he is and what his plan is for me. Um, Romans 6 and verse 17 says, uh, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. From the heart, you obeyed that doctrine. You took a choice to obey the doctrine, to obey the teaching. And that's what we see. We see that um, God chose Israel, right? He chose them to bring them across and and to bring forth the Savior. But even some of them rejected God. If he had chosen them and they had the choice to reject him, it shows a free will. All right. 
All right, imputed righteousness. This is the one that uh, this is the one that Tanner is going to have some problems with. And Tanner, I want you to think about this. Use Second Corinthians five and verse twenty-one to bring that home. Second Corinthians five twenty-one. Um, Give me second Corinthians first. In Christ, it's it's basically we're in Christ, we're made anew, we're a new creature uh, in Christ. Right. Well, second Corinthians five. Let me find this man. It's in Christ, we're a new creature. I know it is. You guys have to excuse me. I'm a little bit nervous about this. So, it's a new creation in Christ. It's 517. <laughs> Some guys are out there like, man, it's 17. Go to 17, Matt. You're close. You're just way off. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is the thing. In Christ is a very important aspect of this. If we're going to say that we're totally depraved and can't seek God, then we can't even know the way to get into Christ. But I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how you can get into Christ and have his righteousness imputed to you. Romans 5 and verse 8. Let's see, actually... Well, you're condemned in Christ, right? You're condemned outside of Christ, excuse me. People are condemned outside of Christ. And in Christ, they have redemption. In Christ is where his blood is. Uh, Ephesians 1 and 7, Colossians 2 and 13. Um, is that it? There's another one. It's Colossians 1 14, Ephesians 1 7, and Ephesians 2 13. In Christ is where his blood is. And there's a way to get there. To get to in Christ, you have to be baptized into Christ. All right, so Romans 6, it'll tell you this explicitly. In Christ is a new creation. I agree with you on that, Tanner. But anybody, even anybody watching this right now, can just choose that. They, that's in their own mind. They can just choose it. It's a free will decision. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that former doctrine to which you were delivered. That's in verse 17. Back it up a few verses. Back it up to Romans 6 and verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ? Uh, verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him that through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also... Uh, we should walk in newness of life. So we can be baptized into Christ. That's where his righteousness is imputed to us. Um, I, I want to bring up a few things after addressing those arguments. Faith itself is a work. Can you pull up? Let's see. Faith itself. Uh, I'm looking through my memes, looking through a few memes here. Mm. Let's start somewhere else. Let's start here. There's different types of works described in the Bible. If you'll put up uh, 2A for me. There's different types of work described in the Bible. And I want to give Tanner credit to a, to a few of the works that are condemned. Because we don't need to accept all works as valuable to salvation. Works of obedience are valuable to our salvation. But as far as um, works of the old law or works of merit, these are not valuable for salvation. Okay. Um, okay, so you'll see that uh, in, the, in the first little pericope I got there, you have works of the law. Those are condemned. You can't be saved by that. Um, it says, by works of the law, no flesh shall be justified, Galatians 2.16. If you look down a little further, it says, uh, now the, the works of the flesh are evident. These are a different kind of works, sinful works. Those are not beneficial. 
condemn those works. They're not good for us. Um, Titus 3, 5, works of merit, doing works of our own, trying to be so good that God will save us. He's not going to save us because we're so good. It's not how salvation works. Okay, so there's some works that are condemned. There's some works that are essential to our salvation. It's not working out our own plan. You can get rid of the meme for me. It's not working out our own plan of salvation. It's not working the old works of the law, not the works of the flesh, the sinful works of the flesh. We're not saved by any of that. We're saved by works of obedience. If you go to 2B, okay, so in two in this meme here, 2B, essential works that are essential to your salvation, Tanner, are a work of repentance. Repentance is a work. You have to bear fruit worthy of repentance. As John the Baptist said in Matthew 3, those Jews were required to work, have fruit worthy of repentance. Uh, John 6, 29, then Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Belief itself is a work. And I can show that. I have some more memes here. Let's go with... Uh, Let's go with 8B. Okay. If you look here at 8B, Jesus is going to tell you that there is a work you have to do to inherit eternal life, Tanner. It's free will. God did not just gift you with the knowledge you've had. You've had to study that. Um, though, granted, I think some parts of it are wrong, but I do know that you had to study and pull some fruit from the gospel in order to uh, have this knowledge. It wasn't just gifted to you automatically. And 8b, you'll see here that do Jesus says to the, the, the Jews have been following him. He just fed 5,000 people, and the Jews follow him, and um, they're wanting to get loaves of bread. They're chasing him down for bread. And Jesus says, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. So Jesus is saying, do not labor for the food that perishes, but, but what, Jesus? He's saying, labor for the food that endures to eternal life. If you go to 8C. So, um, because of, so he tells them, uh, you need to labor for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has sent his, set his seal on him. You need to labor for this eternal life, the food to eternal life, which is faith. Um, the Jews then ask him, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work those works, work the works of God? What do we do? What can we do? I know you don't like that word, do, but it's in there. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. That's, um, that's part of it. Like, we, we need to believe, and I know you agree that we need to believe. Um, the, the thing that I want to I address here is that um, the teaching of total depravity, I'm totally depraved. I don't know why you're even speaking if I'm so totally depraved that I can't even understand that. If I can't seek God of my own will, I don't even understand why you entered the debate. That doesn't make sense. We need to let go of that doctrine. It's not true. And you know this. We've had this discussion. Uh, back in December when we sat down and had that study, I know that you agreed to the fact that babies aren't going to hell. You agreed to that. We agreed to several things, and, and I appreciate that about you. I don't know... Um, from our study, I'm not sure why you went back into those things. It doesn't make much sense. But now you went to Abraham, and you were talking about Abraham. Can you put up 9a? And Abraham believed God. Yes, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He didn't do it by works of the law, as Romans 4.3 was tell. Uh, no, Romans 4.3 is works of merit. <laughs> Excuse me. Romans 4.3, you're not going to merit yourself into heaven. All right, so here, Abraham believed God. This comes from Genesis 5, 6. How did Abraham believe God? This is an obedient belief. Uh, God told Abraham that he would have an heir from his own body. Okay, so Abraham's going to have a child from his own body. He has to do something in order to make that happen. So when Abraham believed God, verse 6, 
And by having, uh, by having marital relations with Sarah and trusting that God would provide a son for him, if Abraham did not have marital relations with Sarah, then his belief would not have been counted righteous. He would, because through, Sarah's, uh, through his own body, Christ would come. Um, and from this point, we know that he had to do something. When God told him, you're going to have fruit from your own body, it's going to bless nations, he had to do something. He had to use his body in order to fulfill that. Um, and from this, I'm going to turn it back over to you and uh, wait for some more arguments. All right. Uh, well, uh, we had a, a good interaction there, and uh, I'm ready to uh, uh, make a few comments uh, of my own. Uh, the first thing that, that I was able to, to, to hear uh, in his last statement uh, was his statements on uh, Romans uh, six seventeen. Uh, but God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now the question here is, is uh, what does it, uh, is, is, it goes back to that, that depravity question. He, he brings this up as a, uh, a, a rebuttal to uh, depravity. Uh, what this passage here, though, tells us is that we who have been made free from sin, that we should submit ourselves to God and become servants of righteousness. Uh, and the uh, context here uh, is shown to us in verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your body servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now, that is in this present time where we are already regenerated, even so now yield your members servants of righteousness unto holiness. This is about sanctification. Paul has moved from the doctrine of how we are justified, and now he's talking about living consistently in light of our justification. And that's what he's getting at in this passage here. Uh, he then brings up in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, uh, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things will become new. And he says this, um, he says this as though uh, I don't believe that in order to be made a new creature, we have to be in Christ. Of course, I, I agree with that completely. We are made new creatures. But what's the, the question is, what were we before we were new creatures? Well, we saw in Ephesians that we were children of disobedience. We were uh, appointed to wrath. We uh, walked in the course of this world. Uh, Jesus said that whosoever sinneth is the servant of sin. We did sin in times past. And so, uh, according to uh, the scripture here, this just affirms uh, what I was saying before. We have to be made new first and then we live consistently with that reality. Uh, he turned, uh, he looked at Colossians 1.14. Uh, I have as a, a note here. Colossians 1.14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Uh, I think he just mentioned that in passing to say, of course, we have to be in Christ to have forgiveness of sins, of course. Uh, then he, he tried to bring up the idea of different kinds of works and, and how uh, somehow we, that there are different kinds of works in the scripture which are contrasted to one another with regards to salvation. And uh, I would just point us back again to Ephesians chapter 2 of where the same works uh, which are according to the Christian life the works which were ordained to in verse 10 are said are, are said to be not the basis for our being saved in verse 9. It is not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works that God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, Matt brought up uh, John uh, 6, and I'd just like to, to really go here and, and really hammer down with John 6 is saying, he went to uh, verse 29, uh, where Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And he brought this up as though, uh, or as, as though belief, faith, 
is a work that we have to do. And that's not what Jesus is getting at here at all. And if we, if we were to look at the entire context of John 6, the people had asked, what may we do that we may do the works of God? They were asking, what should we do? And Jesus turns that around and he says, this is the work of God. This is the work that God does to us. And this is uh, fleshed out throughout the uh, book, uh, throughout the chapter 6 of John. But uh, down in verse 44, no man can come to me. He says, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. No one can come to Christ except the Father draw him to Christ. And it says, if the Father draws him, then he will raise him up at the last day. It's the same that we saw in the book of Romans, that whom he uh, foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. This is just part of the work of God. God is the one who draws. God is the one who calls. And uh, they believe on Christ. And this is the work that God does. This is the work of God. The people were asking, what may we do? And Jesus was saying, this is what God has done. This is what God does. Uh, he made a few statements. Uh, and this was about the last thing that I, I heard before. Uh, unfortunately, our connection uh, dropped off, and these things happen sometimes. Uh, he made the, uh, the, uh, the argument that if I believe in total depravity, then somehow that negates my uh, obligation to preach, and that's just not the case. Uh, I've been commanded to preach, and I do preach, and I believe that God does use means in order to uh, bring his elect to himself. Uh, he does use the preaching of the word. He does use the reading of the word. But ultimately, it is God who is at work through all of this. Uh, he mentioned about how I believe that uh, infants, children who, who die in, in their childhood, how they go to heaven. Uh, that does not negate the doctrine of total depravity. All that says is that God is sovereign to have mercy on children also, and I believe he does because uh, they are not personally uh, culpable for these things because they uh, have not, uh, of course, reached an age where they are able to make uh, fleshed out moral decisions. Nonetheless, they still carry that slavery of sin which they inherited from their parents. And as He's soon as that deep. child is able to sin, they will sin because they're also the servant of sin. And you look in, in Gal uh, Galatians where it talks about the two children uh, and the, the bond woman and the free woman and how the child of the bond woman is a bond child and the child of the free woman is a free child. That is the, the, the same kind of thinking uh, there. Uh, finally, um, he made a, a comment, and I've heard him say this before, uh, about Abraham and his justification in uh, Romans 6 and uh, of course he he tried to say that he's not saying that uh, that Abraham was justified by works when he said this but uh, I would I would um, I would disagree with that uh, it says that if he were justified by works he hath whereof to glory but not before God and I'll just ask uh, if Abraham were justified because he engaged in marital relations with his wife doesn't that mean that he has a reason to glory? Doesn't that mean I did something uh, at, at, and God uh, owed me uh, justification because of it, because God called on me to do this? But of course, it's not before God. That is not the way that he works. Um, and I'll just mention that the justification of Abraham was not based uh, on him actually having a child. Uh, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about the temporal blessing of Abraham, that he was given an offspring after him. Uh, that is completely different from the fact that when he believed God, even at the time he was uh, asking God whether a, a child born in his household could be his heir, and God rebuked him for that and, and said, no, that's not how I'm going to do this. It's going to be your child. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, it, 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 he, he said he believed God, that God would do this, and it was credited to him for 
righteousness. It does. It 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 is it is a, a nuanced fact in the scripture. But I don't think anyone would want to uh, say that the justification of Abraham and the giving of an offspring to him are the same thing. And again, I'd just like to point you back to the scripture, which says in Romans 4.4, 4, Now to him that worketh not, a worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And with that, I'll uh, cede my time. All right. Good. I, I tried to hear you there. We locked up a little bit on this end, Tanner. So... Um, I might have a little difficulty getting back on all your points. Um, I see you went to Romans 6.17. Um, I, I, I don't see how Romans 6.17 proves that no works are done. But it says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. That actually dismantles your statement, your proposition. I don't know how you can say that doesn't when those people obeyed from their heart the former doctrine that set them free. And um, that's the gospel call. As gospel preachers, our, our preaching is relevant. People change their lives to be conformed to the image of God. That's how he calls people. Um, I want to go through a few of the works. Um, I hope I don't miss any arguments. And if I do, if you guys um, that are watching live, if you would, just... Uh, comment down there ask us some questions we'll get to it we'll be um we'll be able to answer those questions for you but uh, i want to go through a few of the works okay because uh if you put up 1a for me okay faith with no works on the part of the believer is the sole occasion of god declaring us righteous okay you're saying no works all right god's gonna say there is works he's gonna say there's essential works if you go to uh, see two B. Okay, and, and uh, Acts twenty six twenty. Repentance itself is a work, and if you look there at the side, and um, Luke thirteen three, I tell you no, but unless you perish, you will all likewise. Uh, <laughs> I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Repentance is a work, and it is required for our salvation. All right, so the work of God. You were trying to say that's God's working, but just a few verses earlier, if you'll pull up 8a. Okay, let me look up 8a. 8b, I'm sorry. 8b is going to tell you that um, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures into everlasting life. Jesus right here is telling those Jews that they need to labor ergon in the Greek, same word for work that was used in the next verse where he says, y'all need to do this. You need to believe in whom he sent. So uh, we need to labor. We got to put forth a work of obedience. This is not a work of merit. I do want to go to Romans 4 and verse 3 because um, Abraham was not justified by being so good that God had to save him. When, when God told Abraham to do stuff, Abraham did it. When he was called out, uh, Hebrews, 11, Hebrews 11. By faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed. This is long before he, he had this uh, circumcision or long before he was um, with, uh, had marital relations with Sarah. He obeyed. By faith, he obeyed. That's what faith is. It's an obedient faith. He wasn't so good that God was going to save him. He just did what God told him to do. Okay? And in Romans 4, it says, um, What shall we say then? What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. These are works to boast of. We can't go around and feed the poor and do these really good works that, so much that God will save us. We can't uh, wield something over God's head and say, You have to save me. Look how many poor people I've fed or look how, how much good I've done. We can't do that kind of work. And even in the context, it's works of boasting. These are not works of obedience. When it says, uh, 
Abraham believed God. He, he wasn't working uh, just so good works that God was going to save him. Abraham was doing what God said. When he believed God, he used his body to produce a child, an heir. And you can see that in Romans 15, in verse uh, 4 through 6. Right after that, in, in chapter 16 in Genesis, Sarah gives up on it. They, they had given up on it, and she puts forth the, uh, the harlot to have I, uh, Ishmael. So, yeah, it is a marital relations there. Uh, you went to Ephesians 2. Now, in context, we can judge what kind of works these are, Tanner. And Ephesians 2, and you're a studied man. You're a well-studied man. I appreciate you uh, coming to debate me, man. I, I want to say that you're a brave guy, and I appreciate you coming to show up to be able to study and talk about this. Um, I think maybe our connection's a little bit lost as far as the internet connection, but we'll work on those things. Maybe do it again. Uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 8. By faith you have been saved through grace, and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So these are works of boasting. I'm doing this off the top of my head. You know, quoting. I've, I've known some people to, to really mess up quoting. But let me read this again. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Well, how are these Ephesians in, the, in chapter 2 saved by faith? How were they saved? You said it was the gift of God, and, I, and I'll grant that God provided them a way. How were these Ephesians in chapter 2 saved? Acts 19 tells you. Acts 19 will tell you how they were saved. Acts 19, 1 through 5, uh, Paul saved them. He started the church there in Ephesus. They heard the word. They believed in Christ. They repented, and they, were, they had to be re-baptized. They were baptized into John. They had to be re-baptized to get into Christ where his righteousness is, where his blood is. I want to give you some credit, Tanner, on a few things. You, you agree that in Christ is where his blood is. You agree that in Christ is where his righteousness is. I want you to, to agree to the fact that the Scripture quotes that in Christ is where redemption is. And to get there, you need to be water baptized to reach that blood. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. And in Acts 2, those people were baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, when you are baptized in water by faith, you contact his blood and are in, and put into his body. Okay? And, and some verses to, to back that up. Look up Galatians 3 and verse 27. How many are in Christ? As many as have been baptized in Christ. Okay, so we're not saved by works of merit. You put up 1A for me. We're not saved by works of merit. We're not saved by works of the old law. We're not saved by works of the flesh. We're not saved by sinful works. We're saved by working obedience. And I want to prove that. I want to show you that faith itself is a work, as Jesus said it was. Repentance is a work, as, as Paul said it was. And if you will look with me, in Hebrews chapter 11, have, have you ever heard the Hall of Fame? I think there's a Hall of Fame maybe in Cleveland, Ohio, for the baseball or football. It's one of those. So there's a Hall of Fame for famed athletes, okay? Hebrews chapter 11 is the Hall of Faith. In this chapter, we have several people that were saved by faith when they did what God said to do. That's the, the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11. You're going to love this. By faith, Abel offered. By faith, Enoch was taken, verse 5. By faith, Noah moved and prepared an ark, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed. I want to pull up a meme here. I want to pull up, in James chapter, I want to pull up 5a. In James chapter 2, and I, I, I was tempted not to even go to James 2 for this thing, just to see if it could be done. All right? These are works, these works through this thing is for God's righteousness. His, he is going to count you worthy by doing works of obedience, not works of merit, not works of the law, not works of the flesh. Works of obedience. When God speaks and he tells us to do something, we do it. 
All right, the, the meme, I know it's kind of funny, but uh, James tells you that for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. This is James 2 in verse 26. Faith without works of obedience is a dead faith. And if you can ride a dead faith to Nashville, you can ride that dead faith to heaven. <laughs> if you can ride a dead horse to Nashville, you can ride a dead faith to heaven. That's how it works, man. You got to work obedient. You can't be disobedient and expect to go. Jesus in Matthew 7, 24 says that uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does, he who does the will, the will of my Father who is in heaven. I want to thank you guys for joining us. I know it's been a little bit um, nervous on my end and Tanner's as well. And I think me and Tanner may sit down and discuss this face to face one time. Um, my time is running up. I thank you guys for showing up. Um, maybe a little practice for me. Bye bye. Hey everyone, thanks again for tuning in. Thank you, Matt and Tanner, for uh, for putting so much time and thought and effort into this. Um, I hope I hope you guys have been feeding us with good questions, good comments. They will both be back tomorrow night to address some of those things. Um, Greetings, everyone. Welcome to night two of the debate. This is the question and answers portion uh, between Tanner Dykin and Matt McDougall on the premise, faith with no works on the part of the believer is the sole occasion for declaring uh, us righteous. I, without further ado, we're gonna turn it over to, uh, to Tanner. He's gonna ask some questions that uh, he has towards Matt then Matt's going to take over, ask some questions that he has for Tanner, and then we're going to get into the questions that were uh, submitted by you folks last night. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Tanner. All right. Uh, well, uh, I came up with uh, three questions uh, that I wanted to ask Matt uh, that we were allowed to uh, ask each other. Uh, the first question, Matt, uh, is... Where in the context of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, do you see a distinction made between the works which do not save us in verse 9 and the works of the Christian life in verse 10? Okay. Um, there's no distinction between those two verses. And the same kind of works. Verse 10 uh, says that good works should follow a Christian. Verse 9 says that these type of works do not save. Good works should accompany a Christian's life, but they do not save. What is being in Christ, as verse 10 mentions, that is accomplished by faith in God at baptism. Colossians 2 and verse 12. Uh, all right. Uh, well, I'll just let that uh, stand for itself. Uh, I don't see the uh, distinction that's made uh, between those two verses. Uh, right, there's no distinction. Right, right. Um, and uh, the workmen, the works that are done, uh, of course, uh, are the ones that are done after we are created in Christ Jesus, uh, our Lord. Uh, the, the creation, of course, is detailed before. Uh, in verses 1 through 6, uh, or, or, uh, through, uh, yeah, through uh, 6, and uh, this work is the work of God, and it's done without any reference to what we have done whatsoever. And so I'll just let that stand uh, on itself. Uh, the second question uh, that I had for you uh, was, if baptism is identified as the new circumcision in Colossians 2, 11 through 13, then doesn't that mean it is merely a sign and seal of the uh, to be administered to those who are justified by faith, as in Romans four ten through eleven? Okay, Ken, it's a good question. Colossians two and uh, eleven through thirteen says that baptism is the point we are buried and raised with Christ. That is when we enter a covenant relationship with Christ. No one can be saved outside of Christ, and this is just another verse proving that there's an action we can do to get there. Okay, is that all? 
Yeah. That's it. Okay. Well, the the funny thing is, is that verse eleven says, "In whom, in whom, also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands." So the ones who are being circumcised here are already in Christ, according to the wording of the text. And so this passage here, I think, shows us that circumcision, the the, the spiritual circumcision of Christ, comes after someone is placed into Christ. And so I'll, again, just let that stand uh, on its hey, own. Hey, can I, can I ask one more thing and, and off the fly? Just from the text, just from Colossians 2, 12, how many people are in Christ? How many people are in Christ? In Christ? Yes. Uh, of course, it's, it's, it's those who are circumcised, of course. Uh, it's, there's not a disconnect between those two. The one follows on the other. We are in Christ. And then we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, which is baptism. Uh, anyway, uh, hopefully that doesn't break the flow of this too much, but uh, no, man, I'm man, fine man. with it. I'm good man. with it. Uh, the third question I had uh, was in the narrative structure of the Gospel of Matthew, Christ came not to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill in Matthew 5:17. But Christ says of his baptism, it was to fulfill all righteousness in Matthew 3.15. Doesn't this mean that Christ fulfilled baptism as a work on our behalf? No. Jesus was baptized in the baptism of John. Uh, the New Testament baptism is um, where we contact his death, burial, and resurrection. That, hasn't, that hadn't happened yet when Jesus was baptized. The baptism of John is no longer good in this side of, of the cross. And we can see that if you look at Acts 19, if you want to note this. Acts 19, verses 1 through 5, will tell you people were baptized in the baptism of John, and they had to be re-baptized into the baptism of Christ. Okay. Uh, well, uh, once again, uh, I think that's, a, um, that's taking a distinction that's not made explicit in the text. Uh, Ephesians 4, 5, a passage that, uh, of course, we both like to uh, look to, says that there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. To make a distinction in the two as being separate baptisms seems to be, uh, seems to be unwarranted to me. Anyway, that's the questions that uh, I had. Okay, I, I got a question for you, man. Um, okay, Tanner, mm -hmm. a person wants to be saved. What would you tell them they needed to do to be saved? Well, I would tell them that they need somebody to fulfill the requirements of the law on their behalf, the requirements of obedience to God on their behalf. Uh, Romans 10 tells us that Moses describeth the righteousness of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The only thing that I can tell anyone to do uh, or to, to, in, to, to have everlasting life is simply to have faith in the work that Christ already did on their behalf. Not to ask what they can do to, to ascend into heaven, to try and attain to the righteousness of the law, or to descend into the deep to try and uh, uh, punish themselves for their own uh, iniquity, but to simply rely on Jesus Christ and the work that he did for them on the cross. And that's the only way that any of us can be counted righteous before God, not by our works, but by what Jesus Christ has done for us. Okay, so I, I caught a lot there. You, you had a lot of things to say there. I didn't get a real clear answer um, other than we had to have faith. So there's something you can do. I know you think faith is Right. What? Uh, 
what, what was that? You have to have faith to be saved, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the occasion of God declaring us righteous. Okay. So I want to I just put this out there. Uh, if, if faith is the only thing that we have to have to be saved, then we're going to miss heaven according to Matthew 10 and verse 32 and 33. And this is what Jesus says here in this verse. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. So we have to make a confession before men in order for Christ to make a confession for us before his Father in heaven. Verse 33, but whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So we have a requirement to do something before men in order to be confessed before God in heaven. I will also say that Jesus in Mark 16, uh, verse 16 says that he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So there is a requirement for belief, confession, repentance. Jesus also mentions repentance. There's a few things that we have to do in order to be saved. And until a, a person is baptized into Christ, as Colossians 2.12 mentions, they're not going to contact his blood. Because in Christ is where his blood is, as Colossians 1 and verse 14 says. Uh, can I have a moment to uh, respond to that? Yeah, man. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, Matthew chapter 10 32 and 33 uh, this this isn't the context of justification here the topic of the, our debate is justification and I'm going to press this that oftentimes Jesus will use descriptive language of believers uh, that they will do these things and that people who do not evidence by doing these things that they are in Christ uh, will not receive the kingdom of heaven so of course i believe that everyone who trusts in christ who has made a new creature in him will confess him before men and christ will confess them before the father and so i don't see how this uh this passage uh adds anything onto the simple trust that we have in jesus christ well, the reason I bring it up is because Matthew 10 and verse 32 shows that there is an action that we must take in order to be confessed before the Father in heaven. And I think you'll affirm that. I would say that it's a necessary evidence of our being regenerate, that we will confess Christ and then he will confess us before the Father. Okay, so in verse 33, can a man deny Christ and also go to heaven? No, but I don't believe that a regenerate person will deny Christ. Okay, so, so there, but there is, so there is a requirement then. It's, it's a, it is an evidence. It, it, it shows and it flows out of the nature of somebody who's been made new in Jesus Christ that they will confess their master, and so. Okay, you realize that this was given to Judas here in Matthew ten. This was given to Judas. Yeah, and, and I would say that it applies to him that it evidences that he was not regenerate, that he uh, was not made new by Jesus Christ. But he was still able to perform miracles in chapter 10. Judas? Yes. Where does it say that? Verses 1 and 2, they're going to go out and heal all kinds of sickness. They're going to, um, all kinds of disease in verse 1. And, and the mm -hmm. names of the over these and, and Jesus it goes on and tells you in okay. 12 excuse me that perform miracles and were required to confess Jesus before me okay uh, I just wouldn't say that that's uh, necessarily normative for today that that was part of Jesus earthly ministry uh, that he did that was a a grace that was placed on Judas at a specific time uh, and that was not evidence of his being regenerate in fact, at this time, uh, even Peter wasn't regenerate. He wasn't uh, uh, evidence of confession of Jesus Christ. So, okay, well, I mean, we've kind of went off script a little bit. So, if you want to, let's take a time out. I'm going to begin asking questions to both of these gentlemen from the audience. Um, we're going to begin with 
the questions to Matt from the audience. Here we go. Again, they'll, they'll get two minutes each to respond. Matt will respond first. Tanner will have the chance to uh, to make an argument against. Okay, so Matt, if God is sovereign over all things, why would he not be sovereign in his greatest work, which I believe they're talking about salvation? Okay. I think this is a good question. I think for, um, from the point of Calvinism, this needs to be addressed. Here's what I will tell you. Love. The reason that God has not forced people into heaven is out of love. Uh, forcing people to obey you is not true love. True love is obeying the gospel because you want to, not because you are forced to. God is not going to force anybody into heaven that doesn't want to be there. Tanner, you want to rebut to that? you have any rebuttal to that? Uh, sure. Um, I, I think that uh, the love of God is the reason why anyone is saved at all. Uh, the fact that he sovereignly has chosen to love uh, you and me uh, is the, the reason why uh, any of us uh, are going to be saved. Uh, Ephesians 2.4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy... For his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. The love of God is the basis, of course, for regeneration. Uh, it's, it's why he uh, extends his arm of mercy to his elect, because he loves them, and because he would raise them up to sit, him, uh, sit them uh, at the side of Jesus Christ in glory. Uh, but... I would say that the scripture says that this is a sovereign love. Uh, as uh, I read yesterday uh, in the scripture, uh, the, uh, in Romans uh, 9.15, he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And then later it says, Therefore he mercy, he, uh, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Uh, this is the sovereign uh, love of God that he's had towards his people. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to the second question for Matt. Um, someone just simply asked, due to a statement that you made last night, human depravity is a lie. Or is, we'll, we'll phrase it as a question, is human depravity a lie? <clears throat> Total hereditary depravity is a false doctrine. Jesus says as much when he proclaims children as innocent as the ones who are in heaven. The tenets of Calvinism have babies going to hell in their sins because they have inherited their parents' sins. That's, yeah, it's a false doctrine. Right, when we get through the some more questions, I'll address that a little further. Okay, Tanner, you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I find it strange that anyone would think that uh, the doctrine of our enslavement to sin is a lie, given that Jesus Christ himself said it explicitly. In uh, John eight thirty four. 34, uh, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever sinneth, uh, uh, committeth sin, is the servant of sin. In verse 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. As we went through Ephesians chapter 2 uh, yesterday, uh, we saw that we are dead in sin, that we walk according to our own lusts, that we were the children of disobedience, that we were by nature children of wrath, and in Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're in the flesh, there is nothing that you can do to please God because you're a slave to sin. You're enslaved to it. And so I think that uh, the scripture here tells us very plainly that we are totally depraved. Okay. Next question for Matt. How does sinful and unsaved man produce the working obedience you're talking about? How does a dead, they snuck in, they stuck in uh, two questions here. How does a dead 
Ephesians 2, 1. Not seeking God, Romans 3. Enemy of God, Romans 5. Produce working obedience. All right. A person produces a working obedience by hearing and understanding the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We all know that hearing is a work. Um, you can't preach to a dead person and expect them to do anything. Hearing and understanding is something we have to do in order to have a working obedience, in order to know what we need to do to be saved. Uh, some people accept the call for obedience to the gospel, and some people reject it. The New Testament is full of these kind of accounts. Acts 13 and verse 36 uh, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn it to the Gentiles. So they had the choice, the option. Working obedience is comes from inside yourself. Do you want to be saved? It's a free will option that everybody has. And the Jews in Acts 13 prove that when they themselves deny and judge themselves unworthy to everlasting life. Good, Tanner. All right. Um, it just goes right back to what we were reading before, uh, that a dead man cannot do that which is pleasing to God. Uh, I would like to point, uh, given what the way that the, uh, the wording of the, the last question uh, was uh, mentioning Ephesians chapter 2 that a dead man cannot do what is pleasing to God. I would like to point everyone back to last night's discussion toward the very end. Uh, Matt used an image macro of a dead horse, and the macro went on to say that a dead horse will not get you anywhere, was essentially the, uh, the point of the image. And I would like to ask everybody to think whether he's using the analogy of death in the scripture consistently here, whether he is pointing to the dead man and saying he cannot get anywhere on his, set, on his own because he's dead. Uh, of course, he was pointing to James chapter 2 and the dead faith, which I also affirm a dead faith does not save anyone. Okay, and Matt, your final question from the audience. Uh, Matt, it's about the origin of such faith. If sinful, unsaved man can produce faith in himself, then he's not completely depraved, and he's really not that sim sinful. All right. I'm here. I see my chin cut out. All right. <laughs> It's about the origin of such faith. If a sinful, unsaved man can produce faith in, faith in himself, and he's not completely depraved, and he's not really, uh, he's really not that sinful. Okay, I agree that no one is completely depraved. You have to do something to be saved. The origin of our faith comes from the scriptures. Without understanding the scriptures, no one would know what God wants for them to do. Look at the Bereans in Acts 17. They studied the scriptures, and because of their study, many of them believed. Here's what Acts 17, verses 11 and 12 say. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out uh, whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women, and well, as well as men. So they heard the word, they studied the scriptures, the faith come from the scriptures. The faith came from the scriptures and they used that faith to believe. All right. Uh, well, uh, I'll point once again, uh, as we went to yesterday, uh, to the scriptures which tell us that faith is a gift from God. And it's not according to, to us working up faith by reading the scriptures or having the scriptures read to us, but it's according to the activity of God that he does towards us. In 1 John 5, 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That which is born of God, that is what overcomes the world. And what it means to overcome the world to have faith. God's activity comes first. He brings to spiritual life. He births us again. And so he, uh, uh, he causes us to have faith in him. Uh, in uh, uh, Romans 12, uh, we also have 
uh, a, an affirmation of this. Uh, in verse 6, having then gifts according to the grace that is given to us, with a prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. And in verse 3, it says that God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. It's something that God actively gives, that he gives to uh, individuals. It's not something that someone can, as uh, Romans chapter 10 before said, uh, who shall ascend into heaven, uh, that is to bring Christ down from above, who shall descend into the earth, that is to bring him up from the dead. But what saith it? The word of God is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is what God does, his command to bring to spiritual life. That's what gives faith to us. Okay. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Um, we are now going to shift gears. We have some questions that the audience uh, directed to Tanner. So we are now going to flip to him. Um, and uh, same format. Tanner will answer. Matt will get a chance to respond. And we'll give the guys, after we're done with these questions, two minutes to just have final remarks. Uh, and we'll let we'll let Tanner have the uh, the closing statement. Um, Tanner, question number one. If I do everything God requires me to do, what do I have to boast in? I only did what God had already asked me to do. No room for boasting there. Well, uh, I'll just uh, say about that, um, that the law in the Old Testament was a requirement that God placed on uh the people. Uh, and yet we all can uh, agree that obedience to the law was an occasion of boasting. Romans 2.23, thou makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God. There it says they make their boast in the law. And that's what uh, the, the gospel is supposed to destroy. It's supposed to stop every mouth. Uh, as Romans chapter 3 tells us, that everyone would become silent before God. Uh, if the law, being a requirement that God gave, uh, if, if, if just the fact that it was a requirement, if just the fact that it was given by God to obey, uh, means that it's not boasting, then, well, the Old Testament law was not boasting. It doesn't, it, if you're going to say it for the one, you have to say it for the other. And it just doesn't, it just doesn't pan out there. All right. <clears throat> okay, so there's nothing to boast about when you do what you have been commanded to do. When your dad tells you to mow the yard and you mow the yard, you're just doing what he said. Uh, Jesus makes reference to this principle in Luke 17, 10. When we obey God's commands, there's nothing to boast about. It's not a work of boasting. Those aren't the works that are condemned in Romans 2 and verse 9. But this is what Jesus says in, in Luke 17 and verse 10. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Okay, Tanner. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. If my job tells me to show up at 7, a, 7 a.m. and I show up at 7 a.m., do I have something to boast about? Matt kind of uh, alluded to this question in his last statement, so you'll have a chance to rebuttal that. Uh, yes, I would say that Romans tells us that if you are doing something for wages, if you're doing something for to 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 receive something in return, uh, then it's it's not uh, it's not according to the gospel. In Romans four verse four. Uh, four now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt, that is, what is owed to him. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. If I go to work and uh, I show up on time, I show up at 7 a.m., uh, then I do have a reason to boast. I have a reason to boast against my coworker who showed up at 7.15, and I have a reason to boast against my employer because he owes me so much, maybe $8 an hour for my labor. And so uh, there we have a, a reason to boast if we do what we uh, have been uh, asked to do in order to, to get a reward. 
<clears throat> when we go to work as we are scheduled, there's nothing to boast about. We're just doing what we are told to do. The same applies to our salvation. When we obey God's gospel plan of salvation, then we are only doing what we are supposed to do. There's no, nothing to boast about in that. Uh, now, if it was possible to do so many good works that God had to save us, then we would have something to boast about. But as we know, that, that is not how salvation works. Salvation is found when we contact Christ's death where he shed his blood. All right. Tanner, God calls men through the gospel by the conditions he has ordained and by no other means. He grants mercy to who he pleases by means of Christ's blood. The only way I can be justified, and that by God, is if I submit to, the, to their sovereign king's decree. How does any of this rob God of his sovereignty? Uh, maybe another way of phrasing that question. Um, how does believing that we need to do something in order to be saved rob God of his sovereignty? Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really accept that quite as a as a restatement of that question. But I'll go ahead with it anyway. Uh, according to the question itself, it's because it robs God of His sovereignty because that's not how God how the Scripture defines God's sovereignty. How God has defined it for Himself. Romans nine fifteen says, "For He saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion." So then, it is not of Him that willeth, nor of Him that runneth. But of God that showeth mercy. John uh, 6 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And in verse 44, No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's how the scripture defines sovereignty, that God works, that God is the one who raises to spiritual life. He's the one who brings to himself. Uh, he's not the one who just throws it out and lets it land as it will. God is the one who has absolute certainty about how it will uh, happen. And so uh, that is how it describes sovereignty. I would say, though, that it robs God of his glory if we have to labor for our salvation, if we have to do anything uh, as far as effort, putting forth effort in order to receive it. Uh, because again, the scripture says that's how it is. Uh, if uh, uh, it, the, the scripture says that uh, if uh, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, my response to that, Tanner, is uh, it does not go rob God of his sovereignty to accept his gospel plan of salvation. He has complete sovereign control over who he's going to save. According, Take note of these verses. According to Matthew 7 and verse 21, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, he's going to save the obedient. Works of obedience are, uh, works of obedience are essential to salvation. My adversary is saying there's nothing you can do, and I'm going to tell you what you can do to be saved from your sins. Which of those sounds like a gospel preacher? If you want to be saved by Jesus' blood, then here's what you need to do. Believe in Jesus. That's John 8 and verse 24. Or repent of your sins, Luke 13 and verse 3. Confess Jesus before men, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And wash away your sins by faith in water baptism. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, and Mark 16.16. 16. All right. Next question, Tanner. Uh, my question is, does being spiritually dead mean my brain is incapable of rational thought? Does being totally depraved create a sort of mental deficiency or retardation when it comes to spiritual things? And what is the passage that says, I have this mental deficiency? I assume put there by God? Uh, the question uh, demonstrates a misunderstanding of the doctrine of total depravity. Depravity does not say that you're without rational thought. Depravity does not say that you're without even moral intuition about things. Uh, but it does say that you're enslaved to sin, that a natural man cannot do anything which is pleasing 
to God. He cannot receive the things of the Spirit because they're foolishness to him. Uh, Romans 8 verse 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So long as that carnal mind remains in somebody, so long as they have that heart of stone, they cannot do anything that is pleasing to God. Verse 8, uh, as verse 8 uh, says, uh, they cannot be subject to the law of God. Uh, and so the, the question just, uh, it just uh, it demonstrates a misunderstanding of it. And as far as the, I assume that it was put there by God statement that was made, of course not. It entered in through our parents, Adam and Eve. Uh, we inherited the spiritual bondage that they were under from our parents before us. Just as Galatians speaks of the two children, the one by the bondwoman and the one by the free woman, that which is born to a bond man and woman is a bond child. That which is born to a free man and woman is a free child. And so we were born to bond parents, and so we inherited their bondage. Okay, so from what Tanner's saying is we inherit spiritual death from Adam and Eve. What I'm going to tell you is what Jesus said. Total depravity, he didn't say this, but total depravity is a false doctrine. So here's just a couple verses to combat this, okay? Matthew 19, chapter 19, and verse 14. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. They're not born in sin. They're not depraved when they're born. They're not depraved when they're little. So they have to go into sin. Okay, so they're not born. They're not born totally hereditary to pray. Uh, Ezekiel 18 and verse 20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear, bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. That We didn't inherit Adam and Eve's sin. We didn't inherit their spiritual death. That happens when we make the choice, as Ezekiel 18, 20, and following state. state. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Tanner, if we are born children of the devil from the beginning, since all have sinned and there are none righteous, then how does one become born of God? Uh, one becomes born of God by the activity of the Spirit of God by his working in us, by his own sovereign will, uh, he comes and he brings to spiritual life. Uh, John 3, 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And of course, the wind is an analogy for the spirit. And so we could read the spirit blows where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. It's by the will of God. It's by the Spirit of God coming and bringing to spiritual life. Okay, so the question is, uh, then how does one become born of God? And here's my response. I want to point out that being born again would do us no good if we were born in sin the first time, totally depraved. Uh, if we were born totally hereditary depraved, then being born again would not help us at all. Okay, you want to be born again? You want to be washed of your sins? You need to obey the gospel plan of salvation that's taught through the scriptures. Um, and Peter says this. He mentions a couple obedient works that we need to do in order to be saved. Uh, Peter 1 and verse 22 and verse 23. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. We are born again through obeying the words given by the Holy Spirit, as Peter says it. Uh, and that's how we're born um, in John 3 in verse 5 when it says you're born of water and the spirit. Um, Peter gives you a little bit of a commentary on what that is here in 1 Peter 1 verses 22 and 23. You're born again through the word of truth that was given by the spirit. Okay, 
Tanner, um, question is, explain James 2, verses 14 through 26. All right. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge uh, explaining uh, this passage in just uh, about two minutes, and uh, hopefully I can do it. Uh, the point of James in James chapter 2 is not to tell us how we are made righteous before God, but rather it's to tell us how we show that we have faith in Christ. And the way that we show it is because uh, is, is by way of having true faith. Uh, that's, the, that's the point that James is getting at. Uh, if a person does not have true faith, then they're going to have difficulty showing that they actually have faith. Uh, if we uh, look through uh, the passage, we can see in verse 14, though a man say he hath faith. In verse 16, one of you say unto them, depart in, th uh, in peace, be warmed and filled. In verse 18, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, I have works. He says, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. He's talking about showing faith, not just saying that you have faith, but showing that you do have it to others. Uh, the word justified is used here, the kaiao, in, uh, in chapter 2, but it's being used in the same sense that Jesus used it in his parable in Matthew 11, verse uh, 19, where he says that wisdom is justified of her children. And in that sense, of course, we know that wisdom uh, doesn't need to have uh, righteousness imputed to it. Rather, it needs to be shown to be good. It needs to be shown to be a good lifestyle. And so what Jesus was saying is that by living out wisdom, uh, the children of wisdom show that wisdom is good. And here it's the same thing. In verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified? And there we can read vindicated because it's vindication before the world. Was not Abraham our father vindicated by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by faith, uh, by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Um, here, here's what I want to respond to, okay? Uh, verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Yeah, sure, he's saying he doesn't have, he's saying he has faith and doesn't have works. Uh, it goes on to say, can that faith save him? Can the faith that he has without works save him? Salvation is, re works are required for salvation, Okay. Uh, James 2, 14 through 26 is explaining that a saving faith is an obedient faith. James 2, 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You can know that the works in context are works of obedience. Look at Abraham in verse 21. When God told Abraham to offer his son, he obeyed and was justified by his works of obedience. Uh, God called Abraham his friend when he obeyed God's commands. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 7 and Isaiah 41 and verse 8 are two Old Testament verses that confirm, confirm God calling Abraham a friend. Faithful obedience pleases God. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Jesus will tell you that you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. When we do what Jesus commands, obedient faith, we are his friends. John 15 and verse 14. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's going to conclude our Q&A portion tonight. Um, now I'm going to I'm going to turn it back over to Matt. And he is going to, he's going to have up to two minutes to make his closing remarks. He can take all that time or take as little as he wants. Uh, he'll immediately hand it over to Tanner and end this broadcast. We want to thank you for tuning in. Remember that we have a post-debate show coming on uh, after we finish up here. So stay tuned to the preacher feature and we'll start up another stream. Now let's turn it over to Matt. Okay, I want to thank you, everybody, for joining in and for praying for this event. I think it's been fruitful. 
I've had fun doing it. I know Tanner's had fun as well. With my closing remarks, I want to state a few things from the gospel. In Acts 2, in the first gospel sermon ever preached, Peter, he told the Jews that they had crucified Christ in verse uh, 36. In verse Acts 2 and verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They asked, what shall we do? Peter didn't say there's nothing you can do. You're totally depraved. There's nothing you can do um, to save yourself from this sinful world. He said, and these are imperative commands. He said to repent and be baptized. Verse 38 reads, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That is how people were saved in the New Testament. That They contacted Christ's blood when they were baptized. Jesus was killed so that his blood would provide forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26 and verse 28. Baptism is for the remission of sins, and it puts us into the body, as Tanner confirmed earlier in Colossians 2 and verse 12. Baptism for the remission of sins is how we contact Christ's blood and are made righteous by God and his sovereign plan to save mankind. Thank you, Tanner, for your help, and uh, I'll see you around, bro. Yeah. All right, Tanner, it's all yours. All right. Well, I just once again like to thank the uh, ones who put this on, uh, Ben and David. Uh, I'd like to thank Matt, my debate partner, and my uh, dear cousin uh, for participating in this. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your day to uh, come and uh, listen to us go on about these uh, important topics tonight. Uh, I'd just like to end off tonight by going back to Romans chapter 4 and ask, is there uh, any room here made for anything that we've done that puts God into a position where he's obligated by what he said to uh, return and give us a, uh, the wages of salvation? Uh, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the, right, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Blessed is the man, uh, saying blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness upon, then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned unto the circumcision also, or, uh, was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Remember Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. And uh, with that, I'd just like to end and again thank you all for this. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully this will be the first of, of many more. Um, uh, I think there's a, a strong need and emphasis for debates. And I, again, want to thank both of our guys for their willingness to, uh, to do this. And we hope that you enjoyed it and it was beneficial to you. Have a good night and thanks for watching.